absolute square the filter represents a probability. And so if you have that the absolute square goes like this, uh, and if you have the frequencies organized in an interval of length 2 pi, then rho you can take to be in the middle, and pi would then be the opposite of three, so that minus pi is the same as pi. Uh, and, uh, and so this is, this is the best kind of, of matching of two, two of them. Uh, this one here will pass all the signals uh, with the low frequency, uh, but it would show <coughs> the ones with the high frequency, and the red one would do the other, so they would uh, be nice uh, working together, uh, and uh, they, they would accomplish this perfect reconstruction after you've divided up in frequency bands. And some of the issues that come in here have interesting uh, implications, the issues uh, for when this is failing, this one here would be a candidate for low pass filter is failing because there's some false passes. It's supposed to only pass the low frequencies, not some other frequencies here. But it's okay on the high frequencies. But what, <coughs> and so that, uh, for those of you who know the language of frames, you, you would, uh, you, you would uh, later see also in the talk that this would be a, a possible frame uh, that comes out of a low pass filter like this. But what about this one here? And it's very easy to, to uh, you can just experiment with the simplest kind of, of a polynomial, you know, some z variable, and come up with this one here. So that, that's, that's good for the low frequencies, but it's, it's completely crazy for the high frequencies. It's supposed to kill the high frequencies, but it doesn't. It turns out that if you try to do this one on L2 or the real line, which is where we usually do wavelets and, and, uh, and do uh, basis constructions, uh, which is Whereas uh, operate on the brain tools, uh, if you try to do that, you, you run into difficulty. And, uh, and it turns out that this one here is, is, is perfect for doing a wavelet construction on, on the simplest fractal <coughs> you teach. So, undergrad, it's the, the delete middle third fractal. And so, uh, if, if I have time, I, I'll show you how this filter here gives you those kinds of basis constructions. The title of the talk has something with fractal and basis construction, so this is an introduction to that. And, and with that, then I'll, I'll jump right in into the, the tools of operator theory, uh, operators in Hilbert space and algebras of operators in Hilbert space. And uh, so it's kind of an up jump here. Uh, uh, definitions, an operator C of Hilbert space is script H. E of H or bounded operators, and bounded means that the norm of the operator is finite, and the norm is defined by, by the soup of the norm of the vectors that are in the range of T, uh, and this is respect to unit vectors, and uh, <coughs> that is the norm that you always use for operators in the space. Uh, the algebras of operators would be uh, bounded operators, so they would, they're unbounded operators typically defined only in a dense subspace here. And uh, depending on whether you're close to a norm, like the weak side of you go to two classes of these uh, algebras here, and they're called open algebras, sometimes the abbreviated C star and W star. W star is also called the non algebra of these all things. Uh, the fundamental theorem that got, got the whole subject started was that if you define uh, these algebras from axioms, then Gelfand the Neymar shows that every algebra defined by the C star actions can be uh, isometrically embedded. Uh, I, I, so an is as isomorphism turns norm and, and, and algebra into the algebra bounded operation. This is basically sometimes you think of, of operator algebra simply as some algebra. This one here. So that was that. And uh, Hilbert space here. Uh, the other uh, things that, that would come into to the, the game that I try to play here is to uh, understand how we use representations to address the question of, of the, the variety of representations of subclass classes and classes. So we will have groups and uh, algebras and their representations. The groups can be continuous and discrete. Uh, one of the ways of get represent getting representations goes back again uh, to, to Gelfand, uh, but but, uh, but there are two more. So the G and S stand for Gelfand and Neumark Siegel, the idea of getting representations of states on the C style. But if instead you have a group, it's easier to complete the group for C style because you can still hope to get representations from 
states and states of houses being a functional on the C style work is the C style we work with and that's the case here. Uh, and to normalize them this way here so they generalize the way you work with measures, measures are also partially being a functional, but that's only the Dijon algebra. The Dijon algebra continuous functions. Uh, so you think of a C style algebra as a managing inversion of that and so the state the, the state would simply just generalize the usual definition that you teach your students of how the states uh, as linear functionals. And uh, uh, what about representations? If you have a group, uh, then you apply a representation to an element in the group, you first get a unitary operator. If you have a, an algebra, you apply a representation to an element in the algebra, you first get a bounded operator. It may not be unitary. <coughs> and this. <coughs> So uh, I mentioned uh, the, the acronym here, uh, GNS, is Gelfand Neimark Sieger, and it's a sort of standard procedure of, uh, that, that is taught in kindergarten of the operating algebras of uh, hooking up a representation once you have a, have a state to be a cyclic representation. And so we had a cyclic vector, and the representation, as I told you, was <coughs> spitting out an operator when you apply it to an element in the algebra. But if you have an operator, you can act that on a vector, and then you can interpart that with a vector, and you get a number. And so the Galpin Roman Siegel says that whenever you have a state, there is always uh, a representation with some additional structure in such a way that uh, the uh, state is reconstructed from the representation. And so, what about if uh, the state is pure? Then you will get the reducible <coughs> representation. It turns out that the representations that we will need. When understanding the problem on the first slide here, uh, we, we would want them to be reducible, and uh, the uh, condition in the state that is equivalent to this is that the state would be an extreme point in the compact convex set of all the states. And I, I really um, only just very, very roughly uh, give a little bit of a uh, cartoon version of, of that. Kind Milman is that every compact convex inside a topological vector space is a closed convex color with extreme points. The Chouquet version is that the representation as closed convex can be done with a measure, uh, but the measure in the most general case may not quite be supported on the extreme point. It could happen, the extreme points don't even form at the well set. Obviously, in the finite case, you have pictures here that show that that's not a difficulty. But if you want to use it in representation theory, you want to decompose a representation <coughs> as an integral over the reducibles, and you have to integrate over the well set, and you really like to integrate over the extreme points, but you can't. So Chouquet shows that there's a, a, a Borel set that contains the extreme points, and, and the gap between the two uh, at measure zero in the measures that you use for decomposing representations. And so, so again, I, I won't do that really fast, but, uh, but, but so, so maybe the thing to remember is that, that this machinery always allows you to compose any representation into a sum of irreducibles, but sums can be funny. In this case, the sums include uh, integrals, and the integrals are orthogonal. That means that the individual components in the decompositions are orthogonal. It's just that they, they, may, they may be a measurable family, but there's still a way of making precise what it means for measurable family to be orthogonal. <coughs> and uh, so uh, here we go. Uh, I guess I'll skip the next one here. Uh, th this this uh, goes back to, to the mid-late 40s and uh, was used by Irving Siegel to get a general Planzerelle formula for any locally compact uh, unimodular group. And uh, so uh, for that, you do the equivalence classes of irreducible representations. Equivalence is, is <coughs> that, that the representations might be uh, realized in different Hilbert spaces. There's still a unitary isomorphism of one Hilbert space onto the other that intertwines the realization of one with the realization of the other. So that's the equivalence relation that we will always be introducing on the set of representations. So uh, in this case here, uh, there is a Borel measure on this set of uh, the equivalence classes here that allows you to compose the regular representation of such a group here. <coughs> and so that, that is, is a case where you don't have to run 
into this difficulty with uh, the, the, the set of equivalence classes not being a Borel set. Uh, the next one is uh, again, uh, there's the definition of the regular representation that someone had in the previous slide, but I'm not going to use that slide. It's not a point of really fast. Fast that. The algebra that, that I want to do is, is the algebra that called the Kunz algebra, the algebra generated by these operators I introduced in the first slide. And uh, so the algebra that splits up the input space in orthogonal pieces, but that can be done many ways. Therefore, there's a big variety of, of uh, representations of that algebra. The, uh, what is the algebra? Uh, well, in pure math language, you can express it as an algebra, a function from Hilbert space to C star algebra. And, uh, and so the next slide, I'll, I'll make that more precise. Uh, then we study C star algebras for which the, uh, the, the reducible representations but the equivalence test is up for a Borel have a Borel cross section so that gives you a nice decomposition theory. Turns out that uh, there are lots of sister algebras that don't fit that pattern, and uh, the Kunz algebra that we'll be using uh, for, for this particular purpose here is the most prominent uh, example of one that doesn't have the, uh, the Borel cross section property, so the representations uh, are, are typically uh, very nasty. And it also, the, the badness of that algebra is also saying that there is no way that you would ever be able to write down all the unitary reducible representations. If, if you're trying to do, uh, assign labels to them, the conclusion of the game theory is that th those labels couldn't even form a row uh, cross section. So, uh, <coughs> and, and so the, the algebra that, that fails that is the algebra that we want. Uh, and so here I write uh, the uh, orthogonality relations from the first slide in a more more uh, functorial way so that I have the uh, isometry, I have the operators indexed by the vectors in the Hilbert space. But if you're in Hilbert space, you can always write vectors in terms of an O and B. And so this one here is just a functorial reformulation of the orthogonality relation I had on the first slide. And uh, this one here is is uh, the one that, that uh, says that if you add up the frequency then you get the identity of it, so that the signal is the same as the signal out. And, uh, and so uh, here is it's a super fast little summary of, uh, of, of facts about this algebra generated by these V operators from, from this slide here. It's a simple C star algebra that means no closed uh, two-sided ideals other than zero in the whole thing. And uh, it, that is bad in, in the language of representation theory, so there's no Borel cross section. So you, you'd like to get uh, a big family of pure states, because then you get big unitary representations. Uh, back at, at, at the start of the subject here, there was a family of states indexed by the Hilbert space that you use for generating the algebra. And I'll show you that that, that is, that is uh, useless for, for this useful for, for, the, for the problem with the open language. So you have to come up with, with a big, uh, different family of unitary reducible representation. And that family comes from, <coughs> uh, that family comes from, uh, from, from a, a, an infinite dimensional unitary group that I, I will get, <coughs> get, get ready for you in, in a, a moment here. But first, uh, a little bit more, uh, the operators uh, would uh, be indexed by, uh, by numbers 0, 1, up to n minus 1. That's just so that, that uh, there are n frequency bands in all. And the up to 0 refers to the low pass band. And this is our probability, and this is uh, perfect reconstruction. Uh, this one here is some, if you have number 2 and ohm, but not number 1, this is called the unitary extension principle. Uh, in, in many applications, you might only have two and not one. And, and there's a big literature on that as well. Uh, and, and a big literature that, that overlaps both with the operator algebras and with, with, um, with, with signal processing. And the, the number of, of the researchers who go on the intersection of that is, is not so good. But, uh, but, but it's, it's an exciting, uh, it's an exciting uh, interconnection between two subjects. 
And uh, so here we have these operators that I mentioned in the first slide here. So remember, this one was a downsampling, and then there's a word filter here. And uh, so the question is, can you make this into a representation of this algebra that we just talked about? Uh, so if you can make that into a representation of the algebra we just talked about, then that's got to have uh, reflect itself in some property of the functions m. And so the question is, what are the properties of the functions m that, that accomplishes this? And here's the answer. Again, the answers can be given in the lingua of, of uh, engineering signal processing. Uh, and uh, uh, it, lo it looks like this. <coughs> if you have a bunch of functions indexed by 0 up to n minus 1, then you can rotate them by <coughs> an angle uh, uh, which is, is uh, a fraction of a whole angle. So if you have n of them, then, then you take an angle that's 2 pi divided by n. And, and, and this is the root of unity here, the n root of unity, the principle of root of unity. And, and so sticking in that n root of unity here uh, gives you a rotation of each one of the filters here. So you get a, a column in a matrix like this. <coughs> and the necessary and sufficient condition to get representations uh, what's called the, <coughs> the, the, the <coughs> two properties I showed you on the previous slide is that this is a unitary matrix whenever the zebra grid ones are around in the circle. And so, so that, then that, that's fine. Uh, the difficulty with using this one here is that it's not a group. If you have two unitary matrices like this and multiply them together, it, the result would not look anything close to this. So, so you have to get around this. Here's the simplest case if n is equal to 2. And if you write it in the additive notation instead, uh, in the additive notation pi is half a rotation. So that's what it looks like, and, and that's probably the one that's more familiar to most of you. <coughs> and uh, so uh, how do we get around this difficulty with, with uh, that, that uh, family of matrices not forming a group? Well, in operator algebras, you always have an interplay between projections and unitaries. If you have a projection, you can build a unitary, and uh, it can be a function of the zebra variable on the torus t. And uh, so you get these kind of unitaries here, indexed by projections, and you can multiply them together, and you get a big group of unitary functions from t into the unitary maps on the n-dimensional Hilbert space. And then uh, you can multiply them together, and so all the all the uh, all the filters here can be obtained by applying uh, any one of these uh, unitary matrices indexed by P uh, on, on just the monomials uh, of order 0 up to n minus 1. So the P, P can be a one-dimensional projection. So the projection onto a vector in, in uh, the n-dimensional Hilbert space, and if you have two frequency bands, it will be a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And if you uh, have it sitting in C2, uh, then you get filters with complex coefficients. If you restrict the vector to, to the real subspace, uh, then you just have, have a vector rotating around in an angle. And if you have two vectors, then you get all the what's known as the four tap uh, filter coefficients. And uh, so if you want to, to find the best in the, in, for, for the particular purpose, then you experiment and rotate your angle and, and, and get them all in included in that family would be the famous Taubishi wavelets and, and other wavelets that have, have low pass, high pass properties, the beta approximation properties, and so on and so forth. So, forth. so you see that, that uh, just spinning a bunch of vectors around is, uh, is what gives you these. And, uh, and so after you have them, there's fairly easy techniques for generating the wavelets on L2 of the real line. And uh, you can do that if the scaling, if the top, number of the top bands is 2, if the number of the top bands is n, or you can even do it with a matrix, and that also fits into the same framework. Then you scale with a matrix over the integers in an invertible matrix, and then the number of top bands would be the determinant, absolute value of that integer matrix here, and you get, uh, you get what's called orthonormal, uh, <coughs> you get passable wavelets, and all of it is in L2 of R. D. And, and they all come from these kind of filters that I just uh, told you about. And uh, so <coughs> what you're looking at is uh, the, uh, 
parameterization of irreducible representations given by by all the functions from the torus into the unitary n by n matrices. Those are, the, those are called loop, the, the loop group. And, uh, and so uh, for every u in that loop group, there is a filter, and uh, it satisfies the best properties that we have talked about. And so what I've shown you is that uh, the loop group parameterizes the irreducible representations that we need for studying this problem here. And so the, the thing that I want to emphasize is that if you try to solve the problem about subband filtering uh, by looking at representations, you kind of be lost because there's so many others than, than the ones that, that just are right on target. And the ones that are right on target are the ones that, that come from this loop group. It's an infinite dimensional unitary group, but it's perfectly fine. It uh, has all the Borel properties that you could wish. So the representation theory for the, the algebra that gives us accomplishes this purpose here is, is perfectly fine, and uh, so uh, uh, how do you how do you understand that unitary group? Well, uh, you can understand it in the language of uh, transformation groups. So the quadrature mirror filters form a set, and uh, you have this loop group, and the loop group acts on that set. And if you give me one m in the set of quadrature mirror filters. And I do this action here, so this is the definition of the action of an element in the loop group. I get another n prime, and uh, any two uh, elements in the quadrature mirror filter set uh, are uh, connected by a unitary transformation that rotates one onto the other. And to see that, we introduce a funny uh, function that I'll use in the product here by summing over all the <coughs> n groups. Uh, if you plug in z variable here, you look at all the solutions, w to the n equal to z, and you sum over that in the usual way. And the result is a function, uh, but it still has all the properties of an inner product. And uh, so the reason that uh, you have the action here is that if you modify two filter functions with that u transformation, and then run through the definition of the inner product, and you discover that the transformation group uh, preserves the uh, expression that characterizes the filter properties. And uh, so uh, uh, I still wanted to give you uh, the, the unitary that changes one element in QMF into another. So I said, take two elements, M and M prime, in QMF. How do you find a unitary? Uh, how do you find an element in a loop group that takes one to the other? Uh, in this way here, here's, here, here's, a unit, here's an element in a loop group, and here's what it is. But to describe an element in a loop group, you have to describe each matrix entry as a function of the z variable, and this, this, this one here, uh, where this now is this one function that you mean product. So not only is there always a unitary that takes you from one element in QMF to another, but there's just a cute little formula for what it is, so, so you can compute it and everything has closed form to use the fun from the last talk. <coughs> and, uh, and so I just want to, uh, in the remaining uh, X number, <laughs> not, not very many, <laughs> in the, uh, this point, I want to give you, uh, the, the coming back to the stuff from the first slide here, uh, this is the probabilities and the function of the frequency, and so this is the best kind, uh, the low pass and the, uh, and, and, uh, uh, twin that, that uh, is the, uh, uh, this one passes the low one and the other one kills them and uh, the one that kills the low is get to pass the high and, well, and here's the picture of the one high and the simplest example that illustrates that uh, the one for the hard wavelet the, so that's the, the best known of all the wavelets but if you change this to power one to power three then it becomes the famous stretch hard wavelet and then this one here was the one that, that, that's really nasty. It passes where it shouldn't pass. And so it couldn't possibly live on L2 in real line. Turns out it lives on L2 of, of the, the fractal. And, it's, uh, and it's, so, so this is simply one of the fractals. And uh, so, so now I'm out of time. But, but that, I, I made a couple of little things for the, these fractals here. The middle third uh, fractal is this one. 
point here, uh, where you, uh, in a sequence of steps, subdivide by three and delete the middle third. And these are called iterated function systems, and uh, I don't have time to explain them. But uh, uh, the cancer set, if you call that C, and you can look at the indicator function of C, and you can scale that in, in a manner that's similar to, to what you do in a uh, standard way that's, and lo and behold, you get uh, uh, an ortho orthonormal wavelet on, uh, on the, uh, we call it the fractal dust, where you, you scale the fractal set and spread it out of the real line in a thin way. Uh, uh, but that's, that's the way you, you're forced to do it if you work with a Hausdorff measure of a fractal dimension here. And uh, so lo and behold, you get an analog. This one here is called the space filling. Uh, wavelet function. You get an analog of, of what you get for the Haar wavelet. So you might ask, can you do that for the other wavelets, such as the Delbyshire wavelet, or the four, four cap, or the six cap, and so on? And it turns out that essentially, for the fact of there's only an analog of the Haar wavelet, but not of, of any of the others, uh, there's still the loop group, etc., etc., but, but it, uh, it, it doesn't have as rich a structure as the, the, the application to the, the real wavelets. So I guess I'm out of time, and so I thank you for your attention. And lo and behold, it's, it's this uh, loop group. And uh, while well, it's infinite dimensional, but aside from that, it's, it's beautiful. It's plural and it's uh, locally differentiable, et cetera, et cetera. Funny how far uh, And uh, uh, But if you, if you don't know where to look since, uh, since uh, when you go out outside the, the plural, you're lost. And so, so the thing is that, uh, so, so we were actually wondering about that for a long time, because Kunz only gave a very, very small uh, family of uh, the, the, the famous Kunz data. Uh, By the way, you gave that whole right. talk about the right. Kunz algebra right. at the source there, right. and you never mentioned O-N. Right, okay, oh, I see. Yeah. By the way, yeah, uh, the Kunz algebra is called O-N, and I believe that uh, Kunz uh, in, uh, suggested that name because he thought of it as a C-star version of the orthogonal group. Yeah. And so if you look for it, and if you Google it, uh, you, you can Google on the console, you can do Google on the, on the uh, ON, and ON is the standard name for it. Uh, I, the reason I, I didn't was that I want to emphasize that it, it's a function from Gilbert space to C star, because, uh, but the popular name is ON. <laughs> See, von Neumann gave up. Uh, in fact, he didn't believe there was a decomposition. Right, yeah, into I, could, I, could, I mean, irreducible. Yeah, right, yeah. Mountain have found it, yeah. but then uh, Mountain also realized that. You it was the non-uniqueness of the right. decomposition right. that decomposed right. the irreducibles in two ways, so that no <laughs> one from one was, was any one from one was inequivocal right. yeah, exactly. right. so, so from the other. And so it's it was old. just cast aside, but it's good to see them coming back, and that right. sort yeah. of agrees with Takasaki's and a lot of yeah. our philosophy, right. uh -huh. that uh, don't give up right. when you don't get Varel. So, so there's right. there's so, other good stuff around. Uh, so we, what, we've what always I, felt that. Right. But Mackey was, was so very the, much important. The way I absorbed those things that I learned from Big and others was that, that unless you un, unless you, you focus where you want to look for representations, you're completely lost. Because there's so many that even if, if the ones you you need there is an infinite dimensional loop group, then it, and that's extremely big, but, but, but the rest of the universe is much bigger. <coughs> You mentioned something about connectivity. Yeah. Does this give you an easy way to prove, say, that uh, standard MRA wavelets are connected? I, I think so, yeah. Uh, I, I had long discussions with Dave Larson. He has his, his favorite ways. But I think I, I may have to mention that. Uh, this, this 
But uh, can you go beyond the MRA this way, or uh, this would only? Uh... Yeah, you, you can go to the, the genitalia extension principle. No, I, I mean just in the standard case of uh, the standard. Uh, I mean, you can only use the, the loop proof stuff mm -hmm. for, for the uh, German. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think it's just a good thing. Okay, Mr. Chairman.